Okay, so we're, we're asking uh, dumb uh, SEO questions uh, each week. Uh, we uh, answer the questions that have been asked on the uh, SEO questions community on Google+. Plus. Um, we're shorthanded at the moment. Um, something went wrong with the invitations again. Um, with us tonight we have um, my good friend Dan, uh, the, the best programmer in the world, um, and um, uh, Masataki Wasa. Um, Masataki is webmaster of wasaweb.net. Um, he's also uh, a top Google top contributor on the AdSense forum and uh, also on the Plus uh, help community. Um, and Micah Fisher Kirshner is uh, senior SEO manager for Zazzle.com in the USA. Um, okay, so we've got a new um, a, a, a new um, oh, screen sharing fail to start. Oh, screen sharing fail to start. I tell you what. Uh, you know, I was I was just about to um, make a post the other day to say how wonderful um, wonderful um, um, hangouts are. What a great service they are. Retry. Ah, uh, Jesus. Uh. Sorry about this, guys. Dan's just sending me a message. Let's try again. Uh, this was working before. Sorry about this. Um, oh well, um, we're just going to have to do this um, the way we used to do it. Okay. Um, our uh, first question tonight um, is. Uh, a question from Carl Harvey. Um, Carl asks or says that many sites nowadays have a nice large image on their homepage with little or no text, but but still rank high in the search results. Um, so now I'm thinking of doing the same thing and removing my text. Is it a good idea or not? Well, if your text on the home page is not very good, it might be a better idea. No, um, not a good idea. I mean, there are potentially a number of reasons for why um, those sites are doing better. Um, don't forget that Google was and is in a lot of ways based off of backlinks. So that may be more the reason for why these sites are, are doing well. If you're looking particularly even more so at large so um, think of it as that the flip side may be that these sites could be doing even better if they had more content on, on their page than they are today because of the fact um, of their strong, say, backlink profile with a less than stellar content uh, profile. So um, don't assume offhand that just because uh, they're lacking in one area that that means that factor doesn't matter or doesn't matter anymore. Uh, it may be that other things are much, much stronger of a reason for why uh, a website is ranking. Yeah, good point. Um, but, uh, I, I think we should r really underline, don't remove your text. <laughs> Please don't <laughs> remove your text. <laughs> um, anybody else? All right, um, let's um, move on to the, the, the next question. And um, wh while uh, you guys are answering that, I I'm going to uh, 
um, exit this this hangout altogether and come back and, and hopefully we'll get screen sharing going. Um, so don't go away. I'll I'll, I'll be right back. Um, anyway, the sec our second on our run list is from uh, our um, good friend Dave Elliott, who does a tireless job uh, in the SEO questions community on Google Plus. Um, and this is a lot of questions. Um, he says today, so Flash and SEO, I've always assumed that Google didn't read it, uh, but came across this article by Barry Schwartz. Um, he just gives a, a link and, and he said, I also had a look at the Google guidelines referenced. Um, and my thoughts appear. He says, uh, what the hell? Is this right? Has something changed? Is this a common SEO myth that I have fallen for? Um, and if uh, Google can read Swift text, uh, can it also recognize text in images? And that is less of a problem than I thought. Yeah, so, um, well, yeah, I mean, the, that article's, what, four years old, and then you've got six years ago when they started making strides in indexing Flash. So, um, yes, Google can read. Yes, Google can crawl. Um, it doesn't mean they do a good job, um, nor does it mean um, it's better than, or nor does it mean it's equivalent to having a text, a regular HTML page. Um, it's Think of it as Google is trying in any way or form to find additional content and information and links on the internet. Um, so uh, Google can go through, um, just like they've gotten better with understanding JavaScript, and just like they can um, essentially visualize what a page really looks like versus only reading the text side. So they can do a lot of the sophisticated stuff, but it doesn't um, doesn't mean that like a regular HTML page is uh, now considered to be. Or it doesn't mean that a, a Flash page is equivalent now to a, a HTML page. Um, it's more a you know they're doing a better job of going through it. They can find more, um, but if there's still that choice, I would still avoid Flash. So that's the way I would look at it. You gotta keep rolling. Jim's not back. <laughs> oh no, I gotta keep going along. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what we have here. Um, the next question, maybe. Yeah, I could go to the next question. But uh, let's see what the scrolling screen has. Ooh, oh, next one's interesting. Best direct practice for directory structure. So question B by Avtar Ram Singh. All right, um, hopefully I'm not stealing his thunder by doing this, but um, oh, wait, somebody's back. Um, all right. Oh, Jim's back. You want yeah. to take it away with question three? Um, yes, but can somebody else? Um, uh, oh, uh, have we finished question three or two? Uh, start. We're about to start three. Can you guys? Oh, okay. Can somebody else read it for me? Okay. Uh, hey guys, just a quick question here. We got he's got a few friends with a problem. Current directory structure they have is this: domain.com slash category slash topics slash blog dash category slash blog dash post dash URL. So I suggested that the way to go about this is the is having domain.com slash blog dash category slash blog dash post dash URL is what they should be doing. But they're adamant on keeping the subdirectory topics in there before the blog category is in, which I'm not so sure about. <clears throat> the topics directory is exactly that, just a subdirectory named topics, which has the rest of the categories within it. What's the best thing to do from an SEO perspective? So, 
So my end, I think, you know, uh, from from the community answer, I think Tony and Craig are probably on point. What I think, um, you know, if it was a new site, I'd avoid it. It's already established. Um, you're gonna have to do some a lot of various through ones. So for the most part, I would leave the structure as is unless it's starting to create uh, duplicate content. Um, so for example, if a blog post URL is uh, is supposedly under multiple topics or multiple, multiple categories, um, then that would be of an issue to fix. Um, but if the blog post URL is unique to those three subdirectories, then I wouldn't worry about it. Um, and I would kind of leave it that way. So if you're and, and if you're running up to them being adamant, then you need to start to show them that they're creating duplicate content. Um, and unless you have a way to standardize all the topics, blog categories better. Um, so one of the things is then only limiting the blog post URL to a specific blog category, topic, and category, um, which would be an easier solution for them. Then the only, and if that's not possible, then only then would I would suggest starting to change all their, their whole URLs. Um, and um, to, you know, kind of what you have it would be, would be fine. Um, but there's not necessarily a strong need if you can do any of the other fixes first. Cool, uh, Marco. Um, anybody else? Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to try and share my screen here. Ah, magic. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry for the, the, the distraction. Uh, I guess that's software. Um, this is a question from uh, Lindsay Seagal, um, who asks, do search engines uh, rank blog content differently? Lindsay said, hi there. D um, do search engines perceive and rank blog, blog content differently than other web, other web content? I work with content websites that contain blogs as well as uh, more substantial, heavily researched articles. The blogs are written by outside bloggers and they tend to be of a slightly lower quality than the rest of my content. Um, do search engines expect that from blogs or should I be as rigorous in my blog reviews as I am in the reviews of the rest of my content? Thanks in advance. It's not, um, I don't personally think it's not um, sort of a question of what a search engine is looking at. I think it's um, how are your users perceiving it. Um, or your, you know, your, because you're, you're providing sort of for do two different kind of readers in, in a way. Um, you've got your really in-depth stuff which is great and then you've got when you say lower quality I'm suppose I'm hoping you're meaning sort of not as in-depth more just kind of a general topicalized sort of article um, uh, which ones are performing better um, just why don't you look at that in terms of uh, time on it or visits or you know things like that and then you could make a decision so do people tend to jump off a lot faster or not read it or, or don't share it, you know, your, your, the, the more general blog stuff? Um, just have a little look through it in terms of shares, mentions, you know, things like that. Um, and then get an idea. And that might give you an idea that actually the people want your blog content to be a bit more in-depth also or they're quite happy with the way it is now and they like a bit of, you know, the, the, the difference. So I don't think it, forget what search engines are, 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 are thinking about it. See, you know, dive in and, and take some time and analyze the two bits of content and 
you know, your users might actually enjoy the two different bits. Um, they might not. They, your analytics and, and, and your social mentions and shares might suggest that they all want it to be as overly in, as in-depth or, or not, you know. Um, so forget search engines, look at your analytics and what the user wants, and that will give you your answer. Yeah, the other point that uh, I might want to make, uh, can you hear me? No. You're a little soft. A little soft. Okay, so the other thing I would probably make a point of is if your content on your blog is ranking over your other website content, that might be a bad signal. Um, you might want to actually look at your other content and see, like you know, like Tim said, look at your analytics, see what uh, what your your visitors are doing, what they like, what they don't like. Look at your user flow data report so that you can see where they came in at, what landing page, where they went from there, so you can fine tune the user experience. <clears throat> But until you actually look at, especially if you've got, uh, I think there was mention in that uh, question about uh, the blog content being very poor quality. And I think that as a whole, if you've got poor quality on your blog or on your master website, you're going to get eaten by the panda. So something else to think about. That's the, the Google Panda update 4.1 is the most recent. But you know me. I have to pull, put that out there for everybody. Okay, William. Uh, anybody else? Um, guys, uh, in your panelist report, I just put the link in the chat there. Uh, but in your panelist report, um, you can award the best answers now. Um, last week, uh, I was doing it, but uh, um, um, so if, if if you think that this answer here is 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 good, I, personally I, I wouldn't, but uh, up to you. Um, anyway, you've got a button on your um, comments section in the panelists' report. All right, um, our, uh, have we covered this one? All right, uh, our our next is um, uh, from. Uh, um, the, the, the username is actually translates as transfers to the airport hyphen taxi passenger. And he's wondering why his um, Google profile is not working as well as it used to. Um, he says, uh, uh, hello, I have a question, probably for the most of you stupid, um, but I'm a layman on the subject of Google and I do not understand certain things. Um, Meander Wiki, I'm not sure what that, what that means. Uh, the thing is that I have a company profile on the platform of Google+, Plus, which is a profile for a long time. Uh, I, I was in the top five companies uh, on Google Maps um, with the phrases taxi, boat and transport of, uh, I suppose, large market passengers. Um, for several days now, my site has been below the last 20 places on the map, which is practically not visible. But, but to me, uh, there are companies that uh, a long time ago uh, um, do not ex did not exist, uh, have a smaller number of views, um, do not have any comments, and I have more than 10 uh, positive reviews. So I have a question, um, whether it is somehow fix it, and how is it possible that, to be so suddenly losing pos positions in, in the search engines? Um, thanks uh, in advance for your help. I greet all the help. Arthur. Yeah, I don't think yeah, I, I don't think that. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Go ahead. No, William's William has been called away. Well, should should we be telling Arthur that? Um, um, I think. Yeah, go ahead. I've got some weird for some reason. I think that's. There we go. We got rid of the echo. Okay, so my thing on this one, I think there's he's on a good uh, track. I think he's watched his, uh, you know, some of his traffic drop or placements of map. And I've seen a lot of this out there on the Google Webmaster Forum. 
uh, similar things, but then it kind of ties back to where I would probably start for him would be uh, the Google Plus My Business. Uh, if he's in the United States, uh, I'm not sure where localized he is, but uh, everything's kind of moving from Google Maps to Google Places now to Google My Business, and I think everything's going to be going into that one UI, but then being able to re-verify your listing um, is going to be the big thing, especially if you're a taxi uh, taxi company. You're going to want to make sure that all your locations and your radius of what you actually service is, is available um, on there. So, yeah, it's... Uh, Google local pages um, as well as basically you can get your your <clears throat> so I'm just fumbling now but I would probably just say uh, Google my business and, and start there to make sure that everything's verified uh, that you are the actual uh, owner of that so you can go through the verification process get the postcard or or go through and verify through a telephone number but uh, if you're a business of doing anything you know and you want to get your your business uh, ranked with that map you need to actually go through the process of verification, otherwise it will disappear. I've, I've just kind of seen that with uh, multiple uh, comments out there in the forums, and uh, I think that's the best answer I can get, but kind of look at uh, Pigeon. Uh, I guess they, they named it the Pigeon Update way back then when it first came out, but uh, it's been more aggressive these days uh, with cleaning out some of the, you know, like plumbers or other type of variations of, of uh non-service or location based. So if you don't have a physical address, it's going to get a little harder to get your uh, Google My Business. So. Well, he did post using his um, local Google Plus profile. So the, the poster's um, Google Plus entity is actually um, the, I think, the but business page in question. And there's probably other processes that he has to go through, and he needs to go through uh, the, the main tab and go through the editing uh, console and figure out what he has left to do. Um, it has a little progress bar of what's ha what's left to do in your My Business. But I think there's just simple things that are missing, because everybody's got a Google profile, right? Uh, it's verified. It's, it's, oh, it is it's, verified. It's a verified local Google Plus page. The address is there, um, not the phone numbers there, the website's there. Website's not verified, but there have been issues with uh, website verification for lo uh, verified local Google Plus pages. Um, he has 12 reviews, all of them five stars. What's his address? Is basically, uh, is it a ver if you go and you click on the address um, and you actually look at it in Google Maps, does it actually pull to like a a business office, or does it pull to a PO box? Um, it does have an ad address. It's actually in. Um, the, I think it has an office. It, it is on a street. Well, that that's at least on the maps. The the small map section you see on the um, local Google Plus page. I'm just going to have a look at. Uh, uh, I don't know what the. What, did they say what um, the search term was? I'll go to google.pl and see if Taxi would, would turn it up. Okay. And it is a, a PL. I forget, you guys are all international, so. <clears throat> yeah, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm going to put Taxi. <laughs> right, there's a couple of things. <laughs> Right, okay. Um, okay, um, you're... Right. I'm actually opening the link right now, Jim. Thanks for okay, that. Okay, so, so his, his local business page is... Uh, and I'm assuming this is the name of... See, obviously, I, I I don't speak Polish, so I'm not sure if he's actually spamming his name of the local page. Transferina lotniska taxi ozobowe. I don't know what that means. Well, transferina lotniska would be transport airport. Um, oh, there we go. Airport transport. Okay. So, I, I translated it with Google Translate. It, it's, it's the heading, it's the title of the uh, question uh, transfers to the airport. Right. Okay. Right. Anyway. anyway. Um, um, 
Why is there feedback? Why is there feedback? Hello. Okay, no more feedback. Great. Um, okay, so um, you've you've got that all connected. Um, where is your email address? You don't have your email address in your about page. I would obviously put that in. Um, then now I can see obviously your website, which is VIP Trans Twenty Four for Poland. Great. Have a quick look at that. Um, you've, you know, you've obviously got your information on there. But now I wanted to check: had you actually connected your, um, you know, had you used Rail Publisher to connect your business page, uh, you know, your local business page? Um, and you're doing two things. One, you've got you're in your Google Plus button on the footer of your site. You're connecting to your your local page, your Transferina Lotniska. But then also within your actual site, you're trying to mark up um, another. And I'm assuming this isn't a business. No, it's not a business page. This is a brand page for. VIP Trans 24 PL hyphen 24 hour. Um, so, yeah, you know, you need to you need to decide. I would probably say that what you really need is your local page and not this brand page. Um, yeah, and they're two different addresses, aren't they? One is VIP Trans 24.pl. The other one is. Um, and of course, there's two different websites on yeah. there. One is, uh, you know, you've got a website on there saying tanietaxi.eu, which is you've verified the, you know, the actual site, but you've connected it to VIP Trans VIP 24, which you're trying to tell VIP 24 that the other one is the actual publisher of the content, which is linking to another site. So you really need to sort. <laughs> you need to, you know, sort it out um, about which one is being connected to which one with Rel Publisher, uh, because at the minute Google doesn't know what the heck you're trying to do. Because uh, you've got a local page connecting to VIP Trans 24, VIP Trans. Yes, you've got the Follow Me connected to that, but you're also telling Google that the other one. Um, which is the airport transfers from Warsaw, the VIP Trans 24, is the brand page. But on that brand page, you're telling him the other website is your site. So I would separate the two, the, the VIP Trans 24 Poland brand page becomes your Traniet Taxi Rail Publisher. The VIP Trans 24 becomes your, your other local business page and that becomes your rel publisher separate all of it yeah you're just confusing the matters by trying to interconnect everything like that um, and by doing that it's just going to be you know clear um, I'd also say on the VIP trans 24 um, I'm thinking I we have a different Hang on, I'm just checking addresses here. Um, you, you, they've kind of written in a different way. So, on your local page, it says Strusia One Lots Poland. Now, obviously, um, but on your VIP Trans 24 site, yes, it is Lots. It's Lots, but since Strusia One and Three. Address ninety one to five oh three. Um, uh, that's probably the correct address. Uh, sometimes Google doesn't accept some, so just make sure you've got all those. And again, of course, on this contact page where you've got your address, I would also um, uh, click on or add that link. You know, underneath your map, it says show large map. But under there, I would also say 
um, you know, or, or, or view our local business map and actually link it also to the site. Even though there is links in your rail publisher, you just want to reinforce that's your local business page. This is who you are. The same addresses and get rid of linking to that other brand page which links to the other site also. Um, one site, one one local business page or brand page um, and, and you know send send the right uh, message segmented properly. Excellent Tim, um, it's really great to um, have a question that um, um, William and Masataki um, um, all uh, have input in. Um, how, how would we sum up uh, this for um, um, it, it, or, or should we move on to the next question? No, I think the important thing is to make clear that we're talking. There seems to be two businesses: one sort of local, one local at Wood, and the other one. Um, in and around Warsaw. So you have to make sure that those two are separate and then the associated Google Plus entities are also linked to the correct website and making sure that the business the business is separated enough and independent enough from one another if they are such. If it's one big company operating two places that's that would be a different matter but it sounds like they're two different brands, two different websites, two different locations. So make sure that everything is sort of connected up properly. I think that I think that's where I'd start. Okay. Um, look, I'm sorry for the feedback we, we're getting. Um, I, it seems that this is going to be one of those nights that uh, um, everything goes wrong. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm just uh, hitting the mute button as quickly as I can as soon as I stop talking. Um, can you hear me okay or not? I don't clear. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, all right. And if you're listening, Larry, look, um, please, I'll be good. I won't do it, I won't do it again. I'll, I'll, I'll behave. Um, just don't muck up my hangout. Um, all right. Um, Let's move on um, to uh, our next uh, question, um, and it is um, um, from Sorab Tawari, who asks, "How can we improve the page authority of any website?" Um, he said, "Is it, or is it important uh, nowadays?" Anybody at all? Well, you know, basically we're talking about links, right? Right, Jim? I mean, well, it comes down to links. I mean, depends on what we're looking for in the links and the quality of the signal. Yeah, you're going to hear a lot of people out there say links are great, and then you're going to have other people are going to say links are bad. Um, my judgment on that is if you're trying to go and get these links, <clears throat> you're trying too hard for your SEO. These, these links will come to you, and uh, you know it's the same thing with reshares and everything else. But if you're looking at those as just your own signal, then you're wasting your own time. Um, I think you could be focused on a little bit more things, uh, more quality signals, like some things we've talked about as far as bounce ratios, looking at your analytics, and, and more focused on page quality um, versus the quantity of links that you're going to have come in, because those signals are eventually going to my beliefs are going to eventually go away and we're going to, there's other things that the semantic web is able to pick up and detect more, far, far more than links used to. I mean, if you go way back in the day when it was big, 2001, that was the era where everybody was buying links, selling links, it was a big thing. You know, oh, how much money can I make off these links? You know, oh, I've got PR6 or I've got a PR8, you know, I can make a whole bunch of money off of that. 
and it was uh, it was very profitable for many people. But I think the historical things you need to go back and say, okay, is this something I really need to spend some time on? And I think there's enough people on the industry that have reported that uh, if it's you know, quality or not. Yeah. Okay. So uh, links uh, are. Um is that all that Moz uses um, to, to, to determine page authority? I think Moz takes a lot of different signals into place. I don't think it's just the link signals, but uh, you know, you can they've got their own proprietary way of looking at that information, but at the same time is you know, look at what's happening in your webmaster tools. Look at what's happening uh, you know with other sites right now. Look what's happening with uh, the, the release that is expected, what I think real soon, with this Panda, or sorry, Penguin 3.0, uh, which you just Google search that one, and you're going to find that uh, there's a lot of uh, information that will answer this question even further. That, that answer, that answer. Yes, it certainly does. Um, I just wonder, um, you know, with the um, you know, Google choosing to hide. Uh, their page rank now, um, or at least uh, John Mueller stated that um, the current page rank, um, um, toolbar page rank, um, would not probably not be updated again, um, which effectively means that I mean Google was hiding it to a certain degree anyway. Uh, um, nobody got greater than a, a PR8. Um, but um, yes, do, do you think that um, now that um, Google is um, letting these go, that uh, maybe uh, um, the, uh, things like you know, domain authority and page uh, page authority um, will become more important to people? I think I mean, you can just see just see the guys on Flipper. Uh, they, they can't say anything about. Uh, um, PR anymore if, if it's no longer being updated. Well, I think uh, PR has kind of been historical again. You know, when everything came out and you know the patent was released for for PageRank. I mean, we go back to uh, how many people use that to buy links or sell links, and it was basically gauged for the link buyer versus you know the signal still exists. It's still in the back end of, of as part of an algorithm. Of many elements of the algorithm, but just because the page ranks or the icon went away and you haven't seen the update for, for a long time, one, it was kind of, from what history, I think uh, you know, I, even Matt Cutts even said it was kind of broken at one time, uh, and so they were going to go back and fix it, and they fixed it. But at the same time, as if we're looking at a score from you know page rank one to ten, look at something different. Look at your quality score. If you're if you're a paid advertiser, you know that, um, you know, let's take a little bit of I'll play right back into it. If I'm a paid advertiser and I'm actually spending money for an ad for a particular keyword, I'm going to want to actually know what my quality score is. And if it's actually low, then I need to actually modify my page, modify my ad, maybe actually look at uh, some negative keywords in my campaign. So it's it's fine tuning what we want to see, and it's it's again part of the semantic web algorithm. It, there's so many touch points that you know Google has now with Knowledge Graph, Knowledge Vault, um, that I think that the signal that we're, we're, everybody was after is kind of you know, it's really one of those dying breeds. If we look at you know author the author snippet tag, I mean it was a test for a long time. In this case it wasn't really a test; it was a a patent for page rank. And so I think people, you know, as that goes away, we won't start to see how many people are buying at page rank six or page rank eight, you know. Oh, I can't buy that link because it's a PR2 or PR1. Um, those are artificial signals. They're not actual real signals that we can gauge anything from as an optimizer. So we have to go back and say, okay, is page rank realistically a good thing to even use as a signal? Or is it just wasting my time as a marketer? Okay. Um, anybody else on this one? All right. Razam has joined us. Uh, he hails from Essex. Um, is, is it Essex, isn't it, uh, David? 
No? Sussex. 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 Okay. He just went from Sussex to Essex. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the only way uh, is well. <laughs> And Mr. Taki tells me um, uh, uh, that um, Sussex is posher than um, Essex, yes? Absolutely. <laughs> All the more because you live there, I'm sure. Uh, David um, is an SEA copywriter. He's uh, 30 years experience in copywriting. The last 10 is an SEO copywriter. I should have introduced it. William Rock before too. William Rock uh, is proud to call himself an SEO and he hails from Arkansas. He must be uh, away at the phone uh, so he can't, he can't correct me anyway. Uh, what, 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 what state, um, William? It would be Kansas. Close. Very Kansas. Close. So I was very close. In fact, we could probably make an anagram of the letters. And or, or, <laughs> okay. All right. Um, our uh, next item of business uh, is question seven. Has anyone ever tried to create an algorithm? It was asked by Valentina Huff. And. Any success with that? I see in, in the community that uh, Federico Sasso said uh, algorithm is a very generic term. Can you please clarify? Tony McCreeth said I create them all the time. It's part of writing programs that process data. He said I'd also classify spreadsheets that use formulas as a form of algorithm. And I think the uh, this for the Google algorithm, but I think that uh, with that, you know, algorithm is kind of, and, and Tony actually hit on the nail, it's kind of, there's a lot of different uh, algorithms out there. This one in particular is going to be the Google algorithm. If anybody wants to get close to understanding what the knowledge graph is, um, I'll try to post a link out there to one um, article that was referred to me by Bill, uh, Bill Swalski, and uh, we were talking about how to build your own knowledge graph. And so, uh, it's pretty interesting to, to see how uh, the whole knowledge graph comes together and how you can actually mold, or not, you can't mold it for yourself, but you can actually play with the data at least um, and, and see how all those pieces of data connect to deploy a piece of data such as a search engine. I mean, Google is basically just that. It's running off an algorithm that feeds the person the answer. So when you type a query in, it puts out an answer, right? So that answer is based around a lot of different things. One being the, what we talked about with links, you know, how bad are they? How good are they? Uh, how is your quality or your content? All those different factors. And then also, you know, what's off page? How, how, can I, how can I reach out from the web and see who you are to verify, okay, yes, this person is they, who they say they are, or this person also says they are who they are, but they also had additional things that they were successful on maybe you know, a Nobel Peace War, or Prize, or whatever it might be that picked back to them. Maybe they're um, you know, a movie star or you know, all those things that may, when somebody types in somebody's name, what comes up too. So uh, an algorithm can be used in many different ways, but creating something as complex as Google is, you know, good luck with, we have to have a huge team to build it. Uh, but it's going back to, like Tony said, testing different things like spreadsheets. We write things in spreadsheets all the time, different query strings to pull different pieces of data. All we're doing is consulting the data to do something that we want. Okay. okay. Well, I, I think we've, we've given Valentina's uh, uh, question um, a, a good hearing. Anybody else want to contribute before we move on? Okay, our, our next um, question, um, it's a little bit beyond me, um, it's a, a question from uh, Mark Steenbackers uh, who asks a question about bootstrap HTML elements. He says, uh, I have a quick question about the bootstrap HTML elements. 
Bootstrap uses the uh, paragraph uh, equals cl class equals lead element to make a paragraph stand out. Do the search engines recognize text between uh, the P class lead uh, uh, opening and closing tags as text that is more important, like the strong element? Anybody? I was getting ready to post. This one's kind of out of my league, but at the same time, I think I can actually answer a little bit of it. Um, you know, Bootstrap's a good, good platform. I believe you're probably using it either uh, WordPress or Joomla. Uh, I, I believe that it depends really on how the the code or, or the modules in placed versus you know there's. What what he explained there, I believe you know Google's get, definitely going to be able to crawl that, but at the same time as you you need to run some additional crawlers like third party, you know, uh, code crawlers where you can just run and see what actually shows up to the crawler as a, as a you know when it scrapes away and pulls all the way the images and and everything else um, your styles, then what is it given to the search engine? You can see a little bit more of a snapshot when you're running like a Joomla or or even you know, a custom piece of uh, HTML5 you can start to look at. And I, I don't remember the exact name of the tool. Maybe Rob Rob can probably help us out with that tool. Uh, I believe I found it in the actual web, uh, Google Webmaster forums as well. So uh, I'll look for that tool, but really looking at, sniffing it down, see what the actual uh, baseline web crawler is uh, able to see, and then that's probably going to be a better answer than, you know, us just saying yes or no, because that it uh, doesn't really give you a definitive little answer, but test it. Make sure, you know, see what happens. And, and then, you know, uh, if it doesn't work, then you'll have your answer. Excellent. Um, anybody else? I see uh, Rob Mars has joined us. Uh, Rob's an AdWords aficionado uh, based in the Netherlands. He's just been uh, had a knees up. The um, um, Amsterdam top contributor uh, Meetup. Uh, apparently, it went uh, for 3.5 days uh, of um, celebrations. Um, mo most people manage to get their business done in a day, but uh, in Amsterdam, they take 3.5. Um, and also, Tim Kapper. Uh, Tim is a conversion rate optimization specialist. He's proud to call himself an SEO. Uh, he runs a website uh, in the UK, onlineownership.com. I see that um, our Prime Minister has um, um, offered a shirt front to your mate, Tim. Did, did you hear that news uh, over in uh, the UK? Yeah, I did. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you know, my mate will just give him a slap. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I mean... You know, I mean, if, if, if it was a mental contest, um, I, 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 I know who I'd be backing. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so um, l let's move on uh, to our uh, next item. Um, I hope uh, that's answered that from Mr. Steenbeckers. Um, here's one from... Um, um, uh, Diego Santos Cicado. Um, Diego asks uh, or says, uh, yesterday traffic completely dropped off one of our pages. Uh, he says, hi, yesterday, uh, sorry, traffic to the rest of the website uh, has not been affected, but these two pages have flatlined. I've checked the rankings on these keywords and they both return on page one, as they always do so they can be found. I have no crawl errors or manual actions in webmasters and tracking code seems fine. Um, can anyone uh, offer some advice? I would have thought tracking code, but he says tracking code seems fine. Yeah, well, um, you'll take a look through the, the community and you'll see he said it had dropped off for basically a couple of hours um, and then came back. So, and literally they had no traffic at all. So there could be a variety of things that are of, 
of the issue. Um, and when it's something that's temporary like this, you're not seeing necessarily ranking changes, um, then it could just be your tracking system had an issue. And then eventually that um, something went down in the tracking system itself, or your site accidentally left out the tracking for a little bit. Um, could have been, well, well, it wouldn't be down to zero, but if, if you lost a lot of traffic and then came back, could be there was a test. You could have been in a weird bucket, and while you might have checked, um, you might have not been in that test bucket, so the traffic uh, had a fluctuation there. Uh, uh, you don't know kind of where this is from, so you just say traffic. It's just overall traffic, Google traffic, Bing traffic. Um, Bing had an issue uh, a day or two ago. Uh, actually, more than a few days ago. But um, so, it, yeah, that could have been an area. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities um, that may, may be out of control, particularly if, if everything doesn't actually come back to normal. So you, you what you're going to want to do is not just note you know, traffic dropped off for one of the pages. You want to like really drill down and to figure out where did that traffic drop out from um, and determine if, for whatever reason, traffic to that page was only coming from, I say, a single referring source and didn't, you know, disappear for a bit from that source. And that would help uh, provide a bit more information to where this is, you know, what, what this issue is coming from. Well said. I was just going to say that whole thing about the landing, you know, checking your landing pages where the traffic's dropping off for, because you know if you can't look at what what that traffic, where that traffic is leaving from, um, or or the other thing would be what's the segmentation of the traffic? Are we talking, you know, tens of thousands of, of visitors a day, or are we talking about five or six? Um, now, if it's tens of thousands, then yeah, and and coming up to the holiday shopping and everything else, I'd be worried, but. Uh, at the same time as going back and saying, okay, where did that traffic drop off from? And, you know, was it a referral source uh, that went down possibly like Bing or was it like Yahoo or, or was it actually a site down? I mean, your server may have gone down. I'd go back into your server logs and see if you might have had a hiccup. You know, if you've got a hiccup, then you might want to actually look at your server and, and see, okay, well, why did my site go down for a ter certain amount of time? It might have went down in the middle of the night. You didn't know. Um, your, your SQL database could, or my, you know, you could have a whole bunch of different things filling up, like, you know, your SQL database getting too many queries, could have shut down your server temporarily and then fired back up. So it's, it's, it's really kind of diving down to what was the problem so you can actually, re you know, resolve that so you can figure out how we proceed without having that. See ya. Uh, we have. Are uh, we having more questions on this uh, this topic? I'm just uh, quickly reading the question. William, give me one sec. Oh, you're fine. Suppose the thing I would check um, would be whether or not the completely lost traffic is simply not tracking into his web analytics like GA or Omniture or whatever, or if he's legitimately not getting traffic at all. Um, he could, for instance, maybe have a look in Webmaster Tools, pin down the URL and have a look at the impressions. Um, Google is reporting whether there are not his traffic is down for that particular URL. Um, if he had to, I suppose, he could um, uh, have a look at the server logs, I suppose, if he really is worried about it, and see whether or not he's actually getting web requests into that page still. Um, yeah. Do 
is Jim AFK? Did we lose Jim? Okay, we can move on. Yeah. So the next question on the run list is two websites or one. It's from uh, Paul Edmondson, the magician. And he says, I have my main site for my business. I also have another domain which is also keyword specific to my niche. It's due to expire. Should I renew it? Uh, in essence, having two sites with the same focus, um, getting me more business, or is it just not really recommended? And should I therefore just leave it and let it expire? I don't know if I would let it expire. I'd probably keep it so that my competitor couldn't get it. Um, I would then, you know, probably just turn off one, depending on, you know, where, what's your main company? You know, is it a keyword hyphen, you know, keyword hyphen, keep, you know, all those different ways that it used to be, you know, in the past where it was kind of like a no-no by the search engines to have hyphenated URLs, um, all sorts of different, you know, variations so that you can squeeze in the keywords. Um, but what I would probably do is, if it's your main business, keep your main business site, but then also have your other uh, website that you have, and maybe just 301 redirect as long as everything's clean. You know, 301 redirect all that traffic over to your main website, and then just focus on one. You'll have <clears throat> you'll have more success working on that one website than you will with two, especially on the same niche. Um, you know, make it make it so it's an authoritative uh, piece of um, authoritative site, really, so you have high quality content and you're actually engaging with your visitors even more. You'll have more time if you do it that way, and get more Google love. Yeah, I agree. I think um, in general, one site's a better option. The only time I think in general you would go after more than one website would be um, if you are absolutely convinced that there's nothing more that you could do on your first website, essentially to make it more awesome, whatever that might mean for your particular business as a magician. Um, or maybe if you've got another website and you wanted to start targeting another area, like another city or a nearby area that was for some reason you felt you shouldn't target on your original website, um, or it might be easier to target on a second website, maybe then you would spin up another one. Maybe. Um, I'm not really sure I would probably do that, though, um, if it was in the same country. I still think that's not... I would probably get more geographic areas um, nearby where you operate in lieu of a second domain. I think William's suggestion you know, of redirecting it with a 301 redirect is perfectly sound. Google recommended as well. Um, but if you have been doing anything kind of suspect on that other domain, maybe as some uh, tests, a bit of black hat, whatever, um, as William said, uh, be cautious about that because uh, that will bite you in the ass. Um, 301 redirecting domains brings the good and the bad. So if there's something ugly sitting behind that other domain, um, it's coming your way to be. <laughs> so I'd, uh, be careful about it. And, and uh, to go paste off of your, your other local pieces, that's where you can also build in your Google Plus pages for those locals and then basically talk to those parties or those events that you're doing. Um, I think he said it was a, magi a magician. So basically, you know, he's probably doing birthday parties and so on in different areas. And so maybe he would have a, a theme page. Maybe you have a theme of, um, you know, some, some type of certain show, like cards, or you have another one that basically is focused on that. But even your pages alone, you know, that's going to drive on the Google Plus side, the engagement that you're going to find those people, and then vice versa. It's gonna, they're going to go back to your, your um, profile piece and your main in your link for that page, and you're going to go to your website and you're going to get more information, sign up, call you, all those different things. But it's, it gives you another opportunity to, to spread that content uh, in a, a more focused way. So kind of like what you would do for like a, a niche community on Google+, but maybe instead of different domains, maybe see, you know, see what you can do with part of pages as far as a brand or you know, activity. So. Yeah, I would uh, consider using the, the do 
uh, different domains if you have uh, different uh, different audiences. Um, it probably doesn't work so much uh, if you're a magician, but um, you know, supposing you've got kids' parties and corporate events, you may want to put different um, different kinds of content for the two different audiences. Um, if you feel that one would, uh, if, if, if having the two on, on one domain would dilute your message, maybe confuse the, uh, the visitor or make, you, or make them feel that, uh, um, that you're not the person for the kiddie party because you've done something adult, in inverted commas, um, for a corporate event, I don't know. Um, but I tend to think in terms of, um, of, um, of audience. Um, and I think that uh, things can get confused if you try and uh, if you try and address too many different kinds of people with uh, one set of content. I think that's it. Great point. I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking about separating it into the Google Pages because then you'd have your different audiences. If you're if you're focused on corporate, and I, I take it back to like you know me you know, promoting a paintball field. You know, it's like okay, so we got to both. You've got to page all those different things that come come in play, but then you know how do you separate your parties? How do you separate? And that's where like there's community for that in different tabs, but there's different ways you can organize your your theme. So if it's you know, like you said, corporate, you know you don't want to have all your corporate stuff and maybe have something that somebody might get offended by on that corporate event. That they're actually focused on a birthday party instead, and maybe that you know, little Danny doesn't need to see this uh, magician. Yeah, that's cool. Any other um, <clears throat> any other questions for or comments for Paul? No, going once, twice. Question eleven, it is. <laughs> uh, so Chris M. Cloutier, who's uh, question number eleven, he's got a question about blog post management. He says recently I've made some changes to my blog. I want to be able to exclude a category from the blog page. In order to do that, I have to create an all category to catch all my posts except for the private ones. Um, if I do that, the majority of my posts will be in two categories. I've always kept my posts in one, but I don't have much of a choice now. So uh, can I no index the all category and be OK? Depends on the platform, right, Alistair? I mean, if, if they're running a WordPress or like a Joomla or a Drupal, then you basically just um, no index, no follow that uh, that category, just like you would do a tags category or a uh, you know, the admin category. All those different things we wouldn't want the Google crawler to see because that's that what they're what she's probably having problems with is going to be duplicate content, like we would actually see. You know, master post, and then having um, a subcategory like a tag, you know, like you'd find in WordPress. So you have your tags folder and all those different you know, permanent links and whatever else they have in there. So um, surely Chris could edit his um. Edwin his... sent basically a WordPress site in the chat. At least that's what I'm taking from his comment. So if he was using WordPress, couldn't he simply um, select out the posts and exclude the category that he doesn't want listed on his homepage? Like, you know, there's WordPress um, functions, obviously, to fetch the posts that match a category or a set of categories. Um, if, if you can't say automatically, give me all of the posts excluding a category, he could write a, um, a function to return the categories that he wants returned on his homepage, excluding the one he wants, and then just throw that um, list of posts at his template and let it render out like normal. 
Um, in that scenario, he doesn't need to go and recategorize all of his blog posts into multiple categories. He just um, leaves them categorized as they were, excludes the category he doesn't want from his home page. Um, you know, he's done and dusted. You're right. Um, yeah. what, what he doesn't want to do is actually remove or change those category pages because if they're already indexed in Google or Bing or Yahoo, you're going to have that, that shift of lost ranking as well. Um, and lost traffic once that kind of rebounds itself, uh, because you know again you're changing the category or moving things around, that content may shift from one page to another um, based off what you end up doing. But changing, I think, is going to be more um, of a headache for anybody. But I think you're right, Alistair, as far as just you know going in there and making a couple lines of code and uh, just filtering that out a little bit, doing it that way would probably be more economical as well as uh, less headache. Hmm. But no, I, I also like that option too because you know in three months time Chris might decide that he wants to change his blog again. Um, change his template, you know the new one he's got isn't working for him, who cares why. You know you'd hate to have to go back through and recategorize all of his posts again just to you know, remove this from his site moving forward. Like it yeah. seems like a needle yeah. work to me. Yeah, and he's got to think about when he does that. It's like, okay, how do we uh, allow ourselves for the future growth? And and uh, if you know, when you're building a site, normally you're going to have those multiple categories. If I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, mowing my lawn, you know, I'm going to have all those different categories that are theme related about mowing my lawn. Um, the same concept here goes is if basically if I have uh, you know mowing my lawn tutorial 1.0 and then basically that, that tutorial will spread five or six times throughout my website Google's going to just choose this one but at the same time as you may have a, a possibility of having a, a filter trip and have that uh, say panda 4.1 jump in and say okay well now uh, you've made the modification. It's still uh, there's a lot of different things that could come play at that level. Kind of scary, but I think I answered that one. Sorry, I'm rambling now. <laughs> Does anyone else have uh, some ideas for Chris about what he could do with his um, blog post management, or have we covered that off? Thinking about it, actually, um, I'd be surprised if there's not plugins that you could get for WordPress that you could use to customize the um, the posts that display on your homepage and things like that. You know, you can obviously um, sticky a post to your homepage. There's definitely plugins you can get that will set a category, only one category to display onto a homepage. Um, there's probably ones that you can get that will let you exclude a category. There's specifically a, your homepage. There's a couple of really good tools up there, and in, in the, and I don't like to really say a lot with WordPress, but I, I work with it. I prefer like the Joomla, uh, but at the same time, as the, you have to look at when you're looking at the plugins because it's actually going to really affect your site-wide issue. Uh, making sure that you know, look at the reviews of that before you plug in something. Look at the reviews. Look at your security. Make sure that this uh, this plugin is not going to actually harm you versus help you. As well, but yeah, there's there's some good plugins that'll actually help control that if I remember right. I haven't played with those for a while, but um, you know, definitely if you're gonna if they, they wanted to put it on, it doesn't matter if it's WordPress, Joomla, or Drupal. You know, definitely check the reviews. Go out and make sure that there's you know uh, type in that the, the the module and say you know in the Google search hacked or um, you know, vulnerabilities, and you're gonna find uh, what a lot of information about those. Uh, those tool or those plugins that you're about ready to install on your site. So you just don't want somebody coming through a back door and then really ha wrecking havoc. Yeah, cool. So uh, we're on to question 12. Uh, this is from Swami VK. Uh, he says, How to start SEO for a community type website? He says, hello all, I'd just like to start SEO for a community type website, and his website is coachrevolution.com. 
can anyone let me know what kind of strategy I will use for this? This is a pretty broad question, but um, in about two seconds I've just found that um, his website's got some technical problems. So for instance, his content is indexed under his www. He's got a dev subdomain and a development subdomain also indexed. Um, so he might want to look into um, fixing up, if they're not meant to be there and they are actually development versions of his website, future versions that might come out, um, he might want to look to correct that so that he's not letting all of that content get indexed because there's about a thousand pages of content indexed against those two um, subdomains so, or something along those lines. Can you hear me now? Yep. Can. Actually, uh, I, I think my microphone was um, working a little while ago, but uh, Alistair, you were doing such a fantastic job that I thought I might as well stay uh, a, 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 as a passenger for a while. <laughs> um, look, thank you for the technique. Okay. We can't hear you, Jenny. You're breaking up a lot. You might want to turn your bandwidth uh, meter down in the center of your screen. Thank you. I, have, I have turned it down to, to very low. I'll turn it down so that there's no image. There you go. That's how, how about that? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. that seems pretty better. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we've, we've covered that question. Should we move on to question 13? Well, have we covered it? I mean, I just gave one suggestion that he's got some content that's indexed that probably shouldn't be. There's probably some other things if we, if anyone's had a quick chance to have a look around in his site. Okay, the, the website is www.coachrevolution.com. Uh, uh, oh, www He's got some other things as well um, floating around, like he has um, author pages, um, essentially, um, which is not necessarily a problem, but he might want to look at some the types of content that he's got indexed, um, it could potentially cause problems for him down the road if he's not careful. Um, that's not to say he should remove the pages from the site, but he must or not. Um, I'm just looking at one for a profile called Magali. Um, linked from the home page and there's a lot of content on um, that page which links to her uh, the articles she's written but also other stuff that she likes in the site, her friends within the community, activity from her friends within the community, videos, there's a whole raft of stuff that it links to which is not necessarily a bad thing but I might have a look at something like that and see whether that's um, a good or a bad thing. Particularly if um, if they have a lot of members and they're not producing, you might find that there could be hundreds of um, profiles created within their site um, that don't bring a lot of value as far as Google's concerned. Um, and it might be something you might want to rein in um, from a content perspective. So there's a Google's saying, I'm using a site operator, which is not great, that there's 96 pages sitting under the profile subfolder.
Are we silent at the moment? Well, yeah, I, I think so. I was looking at a few things. Uh, I pulled up SEM Rush, and I was kind of looking at trying to find some information on uh, traffic trending, but it looks like there's really nothing there for even SEM Rush to pick up, which is kind of bizarre, but I've seen that in the past where there's no data. Because um, normally it's a pretty accurate tool telling me, okay, even if there's like 10 or 15 visitors a day uh, going to it, or even, you know. But looking at the actual page, you know, I don't see really any you know, major meat uh, other than, you know, when you go to the home page, you see, you know, a lot of the videos that are kind of put in here, but nothing really uh, that's going to to draw my attention versus going to a YouTube um, video. I think there's, you know, when you, when you de dig into, like, the articles and, and uh, some of those other pages, uh, you know, one, the site is really slow loading, so I bet you we, you could probably end up doing a little bit more improvement on the on the JavaScript load on this uh, uh, content management system. Uh, I haven't done a speed test yet, but that would be something I would definitely suggest. Because just moving from home page to articles, and I've got a pretty fast connection here, so uh, it normally uh, wouldn't have a lag. But uh, the articles, uh, still good good articles. I'd be wondering, you know. If, these are duplicate content articles at all. Um, you know, you'd have to run some tools out there, but uh, it looks like you know, some uh, different people have actually posted. Uh, so it looks like you've actually got a lot of user-generated content. And I think that user-generated content, John Mueller actually, or uh, Pierre Farr was talking about that recently. Um, can't remember the name who actually posted, but uh, I would I would basically look under user generated content and Google penal or Google update penalties, kind of see if that's something also that, that might be affecting you and how you can fix that with you know, the type of site that you work. One of thing I will also look at with this stuff is um, there's very little. I'm just clicking through a few of the videos on there, um, and there's very little value being brought to a user. It's just a video, embedded video within a page. Now, obviously lots of other people do that, um, except that um, what you've effectively got as a result of this is lots and lots of pages um, with no content as far as Google's concerned, which is not awesome. It's not great for, for users either because they come and look at the video and there's no other discussion taking place. There's no comments from other community members um, on a lot of the videos. There's no descriptions where the person that posted the video is giving their own personal thoughts or opinions about the video. It's just the embedded clip and that's it. Um, that clip is going to be on YouTube. If it's not a YouTube embedded video already, it will invariably be there um, anyway. So you're not giving users or Google anything that they can't get out of YouTube. So um, in general, I think that that puts your whole website at risk. If that's the kind of content that your site produces in general, um, uh, where you're not bringing a lot of value to the table, um, that's a risky prospect from Google's Panda algorithm down the road. If you haven't been dinged by it, um, so be cautious about that. Okay. Um, how about um, now? Have we covered this? Yeah, knock it off. Okay. All right, the next one is from uh, the lovely Ranu Jane, who asks about HTTPS and uh, like SSL sites ranking preference. Um, Ranu says, hi people, I have read that Google is now giving ranking preferences to HTTPS slash SSL sites. Is that true? Um, has anyone tried it? Um, she gives some reference links on uh, Google Webmaster Central and isglobalweb.com. Um, yeah, who wants to cover this? 
So, yes, um, Google announced that you know there's a very slight ranking boost for SSL. Um, they've subsequently come out after a, a big flurry of people moving to SSL, and they've kind of stepped away from that a little. I think, uh, in general. So yes, it probably exists still, <laughs> um, but they're downplaying the impact of it. And they they said it was very very subtle from the get go. Um, so the expectation that people were going to move to SSL and then suddenly see their sites shoot up the rankings, I think, was misplaced from the get go. They said it was very subtle, um, and they've subsequently kind of stepped away from that a little further now, downplaying it even more. So. Um, I think if you've got a user-focused reason to move to SSL, then do it. Um, if you're doing it for the ranking boost, I wouldn't bother. Um, one benefit that I keep that I've mentioned on here plenty of times before about SSL is um, it lets you run um, Speedy, which is a, effectively what the HTTP2 protocol is going to be when it comes out um, in the near future. Um, which will give your website, mm, say, a 25% boost in load time um, with you having to do nothing for it. So run SSL, um, enable Speedy on your web server, assuming that it supports it. Um, your website goes faster. Users like faster websites, so it's kind of a win-win scenario in my eyes. And you make a good point, Alistair. I think, you know, talking about not really just a ranking signal piece, I mean, yeah. It came out as a rate ranking signal piece, but I think a lot of people have missed the mark of what it really means. It's not really uh, looked upon as far as, you know, uh, I'm going to get a ranking boost, and I think they said maybe it was even a 1%, if that, uh, ranking boost. But if you look at the overall picture of what you're doing with the website and what you're doing for the visitor experience, as well as securing the web, if you look at the, you know, what history that uh, Google has um, you know, with security, they have a big uh, responsibility with everybody's accounts, data, you name it, we've got it. But then they can't control the third party. They can't control the web or the webmaster. And uh, you know, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of still today, a lot of sites out there with even e-commerce without SSL. You now, and and that that needs to be cleaned up. If, and people don't realize it because the average shopper is really not. As savvy as like you know we are, or, or there's others out there, plenty of others out there. But then there's the regular, you know, the other people that are just going to go on a website, they're going to order something, and then there goes my credit card data, you know. And so we have to look at it almost as a different piece and say, okay, we have a responsibility as a webmaster to secure the experience of that visitor, if it's on on desktop or if it's on mobile. So basically, if we're going, if Google's pushing towards the, the mobile technology so much, and we've got, you know, they're expected by what 2015 to have close to 80% of their search volume is going to be is mobile, and it's constantly climbing. That tells us that if my website, even if it's a blog, right, and it's not an, it's not transmitting any information, if I looked at, if somebody looked at that on my on their mobile device and accidentally got a piece of malware installed on their phone from your website, that's still responsible back to you, even though you were hacked. You know, so there's there's different levels, and, and SSL is not going to protect you from getting hacked. It's just that additional layer of security that helps between the connection, you know, of the, you know, of the device that you're looking upon. And at the same time is if we have a WordPress site or a Joomla site or a Drupal site out there, Every single one of those sites have an admin. So username and password gets typed into that login admin every single time. And if I was in a coffee shop and you were in a coffee shop and you were on the coffee shop Wi-Fi, I can now get all of that access through a Wi-Fi packet or for the, for, through the actual connection packet. So that scares me and it says, okay, I think Google is after something a little bit different. I could be wrong, but I think what they're trying to do with all the security companies and everything else that they've absorbed, they're trying to actually make something better for the web. You know, the, we got two-factor authentication. There's all sorts of things that you know are being implemented and going further. So I think don't look at it as a ranking signal. I'm going long-winded here, but 
I think look at it as a complete opportunity for you can you can protect your online assets versus just your local assets for your business. That's just as, as just as an add-on, uh, SSL is a substitute for uh, for a good VPN. So if you are on a public uh, Wi-Fi uh, and you're connecting to your own site, uh, the admin part use uh, a good VPN instead of HTTPS. No. There's there's some cool ways you can. I mean, there's a lot of ways. If I'm in a coffee shop, that I'm actually going to not. Uh, send a lot of different signals from my my devices, but you know it's amazing what you can find if you just sit in a coffee shop, and uh, you know you can you can literally I hate to say it, but you can literally see a lot of different things happening because most people uh, see go Starbucks, you know Starbucks business people, right? They're all having connecting meetings and their laptops are wide open. So how do they protect themselves at the security level? And they, you know, it's. I think it goes back to a lot of education too. A lot of people they just turn on their device, they do their thing, and then they just turn the device off. They don't really think to go further with malware scanning or, you know, going through a VPN or, you know, how do I cloak myself? And, and you know, how how can I actually do a lot of these things without, you know, compromising my own risk of my security and my freedom? I guess. Different conversation, of course, but. We got a little deep in the woods on that one. The SSL is just, yeah, like you said, you know, the SSL is only there as an additional layer. But if you're sitting on a on a shared server somewhere and uh, somebody else gets through that box, you're probably going to get uh, the brunt end of that as well. And uh, it just, you know, utilize third-party scanning tools. Uh, look at your business as a whole. I mean, if most people put a, a security perimeter around their their business, you know, alarms. Uh, security guards sometimes. There's all sorts of things that the business will do to ensure the security there, but what happens when, you know, they, they forget about their website online and, and maybe they're hosting it with inside their actual office and maybe now all of a sudden, you know, your website got hit with malware because you didn't have things secured, you didn't scan for malware, you got hacked, now they get to your main server, your accounting server is now hacked, I mean, everybody goes down. It's not a fun day. So, you know, look at look at how are you going to protect your business on both sides. And I think that's really the big message of of uh, what Google was trying. I think what they were trying to do is basically get the attention of most webmasters because they said ranking signal. You know, oh, this is going to be a ranking signal. So now everybody had to go try it out and see if it was working. And some people have been favorable, some people have not. But it also depends on. <coughs> Things did you get hit by a different algorithm when you when you switched over to SSL? You know, there's a lot of reports right now. Oh, we switched over to SSL and all my rankings gone, or it dropped down. It's not back to the same. Well, you have to also go back and look at. Okay, well, do they have bad backlinks? Do they have low quality content? Are they, you know, do they spin articles? Did they buy press release you know pieces? What what did they do um, on top of just the SSL thing? So I think. Some of those articles that are being written out there are really not completely true, but that's my opinion. And I'm not a writer, so I don't really actually want to compete against all that. Okay. Have we covered this one? Yep. Thanks, uh, Alistair. Um, here's one from. Uh, Tony McCreeth, our great friend Tony, um, operates um, uh, Website Advantage. Um, he's Adelaide's leading SEO. Um, he said, it's titled to disavow or not to disavow. He said, I was just checking my backlinks and spotted one that was quite random. It was in a spun article and I presume the random link with a random keyword uh, was in there to try and make the article look more legitimate. What should I do? Um, now and forget about it. Yeah, I just just about and move on. Or if there's not many of them, probably just ignore it entirely. Mm. 
Yeah. Does it say how many links he's got that he's trying to disavow? It looks like a channel one. Just one link to disavow. I wouldn't even bother with the disavow tool. I mean, really, uh, Google's automatically going to find that, and it's going to actually filter it out by itself. I mean, that's what artificial intelligence and machine learning does. But at the same time, as if they, he starts to get a whole bunch of them, then maybe you know, figure out why they're coming. Somebody actually trying to, to negative SEO him, or and then okay, maybe that link disavow tool would probably come in for that. But I think that links are still going to go on away, and I think that there needs to be additional signals built upon that. And if he's focused on just links uh, or disavowing because it doesn't look right. That's not going to help him rank better. It's even if he disavowed it, it's not going to have any you know rank change at all. Um, besides, anything right now that's disavowed, from what I understand, uh, that's going into Panda or Penguin 3.0. Anything that was disavowed uh, before will go into the index. Anything that's being disavowed now is not going into the current index for first rollout. So that's kind of what I've read in the past. And if uh, the, the whole site is, uh, well, low quality, then I would uh, disavow the whole uh, domain and not just uh, the URL. Uh, Tony did provide it the URL, but I have got time to check it out. So. The hard part is when we're, we're, you know, especially working with clients that have been, you know, having to utilize the disavow tool, or you know, basically, they come to when they come in, they're like, "Oh, we we work from a different agency. They did this, this, and this." Now I would probably say, "Okay, at that point, you know, going through and probably hammering out the, you know, going through the list, you know, kicking it out in an Excel spreadsheet, and then just mark it up and say, okay, I emailed this person on this date. I phone called this person on this date, and I've got a response.' And then move on. Do something else. Don't, you know, <clears throat> don't spend all your waking time on trying to get a link taken off or you know, because if you can build value, like Edwin said, you know, build the value of the content, build the experience, look at your bounce rates, clean the, you know, make sure that people aren't just leaving your site. What are they doing when they get to your site? Uh, what is your goal of your website? Are you selling something? Are you, you know, are you doing a service? Are you, is it a lead gen or is it actually e-commerce? All these different questions come in, but what the end of the day is, am I making money from my website or am I just wasting my time? Um, and then how can I make more money from my website by doing the right things that are going to be beneficial for my visitor experience? So I wouldn't waste time on the links, especially if there's only one. Okay. I just realized I forgot to mention uh, Edwin Yonk, who's CEO of idastoast.nl uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, okay. Uh, um, Let's move on from Tony's question and uh, go to uh, one from Digital Spark Marketing. It's an interesting one, best practice for local search. Um, he says, I have a, a local SEO question. I run a small business from a small Florida town that draws customers from uh, a region of five to six uh, small towns within a radius of 20 miles. Um, to optimize my local SEO, I include a comment supporting northern, uh, and gives the name of the county, uh, including the towns of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, and, and he puts that on the bottom of the web page. Is this the most effective way to deal with local search in these five to six towns? Uh, any suggestions? Does it say where, basically, location-wise? I mean, as the did you say Netherlands? No. I wouldn't uh, list all your uh, towns, neighborhoods, or what have you in 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 the footer. Um, if you have five towns in the footer, um, that, that might be okay. But um, if you're going to to add more and more, then uh, you, you you're going to get hurt uh, for uh, keyword stuffing, for example. Yeah, and I think that to, 
very good valid point. You see a lot of those sites that, that basically say I'm servicing all these different cities uh, and area, and Google's going to figure out where your, your radius is. I mean, if, you, if you've got everything set up with your local business and, and you're getting reviews and those reviews are actually coming in from some of your customers that are in that, that area, you know, Google's going to track the IP address of those customers, and it's going to know where they are, and, and the radius of those customers and the review that you're getting, you know, that's that could be something that can also help for uh, semantic signals. So you're basically putting, you know, allowing Google to, to, to find other entities out there that associate to you. And I think, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different things that you can actually do to help, depending on what your products and services are. Uh, an example would be maybe a plumber going to, um, you know, a local area and actually taking a picture of before and after. The metadata will actually be localized to that city. So wherever I was, and I took those before and after pictures of what I just did on a project, I'm going to know that basically I had, you know, Google's going to tag that. It's going to have the meta, meta information that can go, go back and connect the dots again. So really it's kind of connecting the dots, I think. You know, so there might be, like, don't do it on page, do it off page. Do it. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with uh, Rob Master. He just wrote uh, published reviews about uh, your local customers from those uh, five towns. Uh, uh, interviews uh, with local radio stations uh, that can uh, be helpful. And Make sure that those uh, uh, town names are connected with your brand. And but just publish, if, if, if you just put them in the footer, uh, that's pretty much all tactic. Uh, not that helpful anymore. Well, thank you, William. I've got, I've got to bail out of here and get to a meeting, and then I'm going to try to come back, guys. But this has been a fun show. I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, knowledge dumps here. I think it helps for everybody. All right. I'm out. Thanks, man. Talk soon. All right. Uh, and we covered this for digital spark marketing? Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Alistair. Um, here's one from Philip Ellis. Um, he wants to uh, uh, know about Google's understanding of, of URLs. Uh, he says, hi guys, uh, long time reader, first time posting. I have a question regarding Google's intelligence when it comes to understanding URLs. I'm about to engage in a lengthy content building campaign for a particular school test. I want to provide uh, information for students about the New York uh, Regents exam. I will have the domain website.com slash regents. Um, in, in terms of keywords, uh, I will be targeting slash regents hyphen prep and other regents variations. Rather than have regents occurring twice in the URL like this, website slash regents slash regents hyphen prep, is Google smart enough to know that if I were to leave it as website slash Regents slash prep that I am targeting Regents prep. A mouthful there, I know, but I hope it all made sense. Uh, yes, simplistically, I think yes, they will understand that. So you can see this in action for yourself uh, when you do an average query and have a look at the words that Google highlights in the URL um, as an example they are bold um, sections of the URL in the SERPs. Um, and you'll see this kind of behavior in place where folders get highlighted, for instance. Um, I, I wouldn't be concerned with either including website regions, regions prep, or doing what you suggested with website regions prep. I think either's fine. Um, I don't think you're going to get a, a ranking boost or penalty kind of thing in either case. Both are a nice, clean URL. Um, do what's convenient for you.
Okay, they're dropping like flies. Um, William Roth has left us, Rob Mars has left us. Um, anybody else on um, Philip Ellis's question? I'm not um, just re reading the question. I, I don't know if this one is just for New York um, or are you including other areas within it? Uh, just a thing there, if you obviously, you know, uh, on your New York page, um, also you schema markup, um, you know, the, lo the, the locality, um, which just helps provide the extra signals in terms of the different areas. All right, uh, Philip Ellis, uh, I, I hope um, that, that that is of assistance to you. Sarab uh, Rowat asks, are no follow outbound links responsible for ranking? The, a no follow attribute uh, indicates that the link within the anchor tag must not be followed by the search engines. My question is that no follow uh, or are uh, no-follow outbound links uh, responsible for ranking. Um, he said, I, I read in an SEO blog, anchor text, having the right anchor text will also help your no-follow links improve ranking. Is it true? So, I'm not, I've never tested this. So this is just based on Google uh, verbiage, but they say that you apply no follow link, no follow attribute to a link, um, or to a meta tag for all links on the page, and Google will disregard the links entirely um, in, in every way. They don't form part of the link graph. They don't part, uh, pass page rank. Um, so it, to me, it suggests that anchor text that was attached to a link that was no followed would be ignored as well. If the link isn't part of the link graph, then you would think that the anchor text for the link would also be removed from any calculations that might be uh, taking place from Google's side of the fence at the same time. Um, why not run a test and find out for yourself? When you do, come back and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody um, want, want to add to that? All right, uh, let's um, move on down to uh, um, question 18 on, on our run list. That this was asked tonight on, on the SEO questions community on Google Plus. Um, titled Panda Penalty and Content Below the Fold. John Pitcher said, uh, I have uh, been reading that uh, content below the fold can, can, can trigger a panda penalty. If you have a site uh, with ads at the top, this makes sense. What about w normal websites, though? Um, when you have a, a, a nice, large, attractive visual at the top, often an image or rotating images, often with both a visual element and, and a few slogan-type words attractively formatted as part of the image. Customers often like to have a nice large logo and a nice impressive looking visual at the top to grab the reader's attention. Generally, I think that's fine. I mean, does it take up the entire page? Because uh, if it does, that's a massive image, you know, right above the fold. Um, 
and generally they don't take up the entire page above the fold. Um, but I think what you're referring to tends to be more adverts, like you've said. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, and also, um, oh, what was the and pop-ups now? You know, uh, very large pop-ups that keep popping up. There's a there's a filter with that now also. But I think if you have a really nice header image, um, I don't I don't foresee it being a you know an issue um, if it takes up the entire the above the fold. Well, yeah, in terms of a user experience, that's not um, going to be that great. And I don't know, you know. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a header image that big. I think the litmus for this, um, which Google has spoken about a lot of times before, is um, um, UE element or a common design choice across the internet. Um, you should consider it to be okay. Google obviously needs to roll with the times um, in terms of common user interface design concepts and things like that. So if it's common that people would carry header photos of a similar size to what you're talking about um, and you see that regularly, then I think you should feel free to use it as well um, and not be worried about the risks of penalties. If you're talking about doing one that's substantially bigger, where essentially the majority of the above the fold space is taken out of a contention with the image and the content is literally at the very bottom of the viewport, then you might consider, you know what, I'm probably pushing too hard. Um, this is well beyond what other uh, websites are doing in terms of common, in terms of its size and emphasis. That's how I would look at that. Well, and I think it is industry uh, dependent. Um, he's talking about kitchens and bathrooms or bathrooms. So maybe, maybe people want those big pictures first. Um, so if, if this is helpful for your users, I would keep them. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I've been looking at um, rammed earth, um, um, people building, you know, rammed earth construction, and uh, it's so painful when you come to a, a, a website and, and they've got a, a tiny, uh, you know, 180 by 180 image. It's just ridiculous. Uh, it just kills me. Um, but yeah, um, I mean. We're coming into a time when when bandwidth is uh, free and, and, and large. Um, once upon a time, all websites had uh, very small images. But now um, there's plenty of bandwidth, and um, people are taking advantage of it. And the sites that use the larger images uh, stand out. Can I have a, an attempt at uh, not quite answering the question here, but uh, and a sample of one, uh, which is that uh, I've been um, involved in looking at a site with some big pages, uh, big images at the top of the page, um, and the the data from how far people get down the uh, um, the page um, suggests that something over 90% of people get into the um, the, the, the content, the, the written content, the, the words, um, before stopping. In other words, they are they are just happily scrolling past the, um, the big image. Um, if that's typical, then at the very least, um, Google shouldn't be penalizing sites for doing that. Um, as I say, it's not a it's not an answer to the question, but it's a I think it's a relevant uh, a, re a relevant a relevant observation. Google's been on a penalty binge for years. Uh, they penalise everybody for everything. Um, all right. Um, 
John Pitcher also asks another question uh, on de-indexing de uh, thin content. Uh, he said, I have a site that's currently doing well in Google, but it has a, a lot of, there are a lot of form type pages that are of necessity duplicated with little useful content for Google. They are vital to the purchasing uh, on the site and designed well for the user. They are not landing pages. For example, for each of seven courses, uh, I have an almost identical page justintensive.co.uk slash courses slash seven day course hyphen steps two and three dot php and then seven uh, um, almost identical pages for step four. Should these pages all be de-indexed or could de-indexing them um, in some way damage the site? Also, should you always de-index thank you pages? My thank you pages typically just have a one sentence um, with the same images as the contact contact page. Anybody? I would know index them. If they are uh, solely uh, for people to buy, uh, stuff from uh, the website, like your address and stuff. Um, there, there's no need uh, to send traffic to those pages, is there? So I, I would no index them. Yeah, same. I don't see the point in having them. Like if they're part of your purchase funnel, for instance, and you have no intention of um, as, as a landing page for search traffic, and it makes no sense that people would would land into those pages from a, a search request. Um, then you no index them. Why not? Um, in terms of the other part of this question, could de-indexing them in some way damage the site? Um, no, it's not going to hurt your site. You can de-index anything you like without fear of retribution, so to speak, from Google. Of course you should consider whether or not you're taking SEO traffic into those pages, which you can check in Google Analytics or any other tool you like to see whether or not um, those pages, despite you thinking that they aren't landing pages, um, does Google actually deliver search traffic to those pages currently? And a side comment, uh, four steps to make a purchase. Um, that's maybe a little bit too much. Very true. Well, that's three votes, John Pitcher. It looks like you're going to Vegas. Um, all right. Um, next, um, it, well, last question for the night. We've done it again, guys. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, no. Last question for, is question 20. Uh, it's from Ty Bowie. Um, wanting techniques to figure out a significant decrease of organic traffic. What techniques do you guys use to figure out a significant decrease of organic traffic on a landing page? Um. One way that you can do this is uh, to set up intelligence events in Google Analytics, um, where you can basically say, notify me with, an, with a notification um, when some criteria is met. Um, so you can do it that way as a, an automated thing. And you could say total SEO traffic or maybe traffic to an individual section or site or a landing page maybe or traffic from a certain keyword or pool of keywords. Keywords is a bad way to do it obviously because you've got only probably 15% of the total keywords coming into your site so it's not a great proxy for um, 
depending on how much traffic your site gets. It's not a great way to do it, but that's that's an easy way. It's been that long since I had traffic that um, it's not something that occupies my attention. <laughs> Uh. Guys, sure, surely um, you must have some favourite um, tools, um, or, or I, I suppose the first thing uh, you would check um, would be Google Webmaster Tools, yes? Yep. Well, just your um, analytics, no? It, well, I think what he's saying is, is, is um, when he says figure out, I think what he's asking is uh, if you notice a page via analytics uh, that, that's lost organic traffic, uh, what, what techniques do, do we use to, to figure out um, why the traffic has dropped to that page? Well, I mean, the first the first thing that you're going to look at instantly is, you know, just a quick thing is just, you know, what that page is, what tended to be your main search query around that page, <coughs> and just do a quick search on it. I mean, if, for example, it was position one and it was getting 50 hits in a week, and all of a sudden, you know, you look in the analytics, your traffic's down, you, you identify which page it is, and it's got like 10, and then you just search, you know, the, the main particular sort of keyword around that, um, and you've dropped for some reason to number five in that, you know, that week or that month, that's part of your answer. Um, uh, you know, um, if it's still on position one and it's dropping in organic traffic, um, have, you know, um, obviously dive into the analytics uh, for that particular page, see what keywords were driving traffic to that. Now, sometimes it doesn't really help you if it just says not provided, um, you know, and it's all clumped together. But, you know, you could have um, different, you know, sort of search phrases that were actually driving traffic, and it could be a combination of one that's particularly dropped somewhere along the line. If nothing's dropped, um, Go into your webmaster tools. Now, webmaster tools is a bit skew iffy, but you could go into webmaster tools and check impressions on that. Um, impressions on it, uh, things like that, could mean that, you know, hey, th that particular term is seasonal, uh, and you might have hit a particular seasonal point at, at this point um, where actually people don't want to buy surfboards because it's minus 40 below. Um, you, you know, so... you. you Obviously, understanding the business, look at history of it, you know, say in the analytics, go back a little bit, go back to the previous year that time, did it also drop? You know, these the all kind of all kinds of processes that you can you can work through to sort of figure out, you know, why there's been a, why there's been a drop if you're still position one, if if you see what I mean. Um, uh, sometimes you know uh, your the, the market moves on. Um, so is it seasonal? Has people just lost interest? Was that initial traffic just driven by by um, by an initial uh, blip based upon you know some kind of marketing campaign that you did, um, and now that that marketing campaign is over, I don't know. Let's say you made a a pink jelly bean watch uh, and the initial marketing campaign really took off people were hitting it for a couple of months the marketing's dropped off on that it's kind of dropping out of pe people don't really want a freaking pink jelly bean or basically you've sold all the pink jelly bean watches that are potentially could be sold and now the traffic's dropping off on that so same again if you're still position one on that sort of thing you know there's all these kind of elements to look at 
traffic just doesn't continually grow all the time. At some point, for a particular search term, you will reach a saturation level. Um, if you are a, you know, if you if you are a bricks and mortar kind of business, you sell one particular thing. You know, you will eventually, ultimately, reach saturation point within that area because the guy 40 miles down the road you know another bricks and mortar business sells the same particular product and he's also going to reach particular saturation for pink jelly bean watches in Vegas do, do you see what I mean um, so it's kind of difficult when you say but th that's the process I would go through analytics drill down where it's coming from um, segmented, obviously look at webmaster tools and impressions, etc. Um, look at previous periods. Are there, you know, uh, other steps involved in it? Um, has a particular search query around that search query actually dropped down a little bit? Um, yeah, you know, just work your way around that that, that whole particular page and, and analyze what's going on. Um, when you say drop inside, has has the drop time on the page dropped? So your organic traffic has slightly dropped. Has your time on your page dropped? Um, do you need to provide something else? Are people looking for something else now? Uh, now that the initial fad's over, um, do they want more information? Or was it that you were the only guy kind of supplying it? You got the traffic. Now there's a lot more other suppliers out there. But they're providing a bit more in-depth kind of stuff. Are people leaving your page quicker? There's 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 a whole sort of, you know, you need you need to become a detective and dive in, and and try and understand the user on 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 what they're actually looking for and wanting on that page. Yep. Pink jelly bean watches, eh, Tim? Wow, yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Well, um, Ty Vui, I, I hope uh, that's the answer you're looking for. We've done it again, guys. We've, we've uh, answered uh, all of the questions asked this week on the SEO Questions community on Google+. And now we move on to our uh, weekly uh, SEO news roundup um, where we add um, new things that pop up onto the SEO news community. You'll find us by looking under the communities tab uh, and searching on Google Plus for SEO news community. You have to add community on the end, otherwise you won't find us. Um, the first article is uh, one from Lucas Regala, um, and I, I thought it was, he said it was. Uh, he said, "Wow, nice collection!" Screaming Frog, uh, um, sixteen uh, Google penalties uh, update and filter vis visualizations by SEO visibility. Um, well, I don't know. They weren't actually visualizations. That they were sixteen graphs um, showing um, um, drops in traffic. Um, but I thought it was a really good article. Um, anybody else uh, get time to read this one? Yeah, I had a look through it earlier on. Um, it's not new though. It's an old article. Not that that matters. It's still cool. Yep. It's the first time I've seen it. Yep. Oh, I haven't. Well, I may have seen it maybe when it came out a long time ago, but I don't recall it off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think it's a good article. It's an interesting thing to see the effects of that. Mm. Actually, the, the, the first news item that we should cover um, is the Netherlands um, um, top contributor conference. Um, uh, apparently, um, Rob Mars has been uh, tripping the light fantastic for the last three and a half days. <laughs> you call me? Yes, what's the news, Rob? <laughs> oh, those were great days. Uh, see, getting some recognition and uh, having uh, a lot of fun. 
but nothing about penguin. That's, that's a good point. Gary Illy said that penguin was due. Uh, to be a week ago now, like he, he, about two weeks ago, he said it's about a week away. Yeah, well, they didn't know anything. There weren't any specific subjects, or no, a lot of subjects there. Yeah. But the things that were interesting are in the NDA, yeah. <laughs> well, don't hold out on us. We won't tell. I know. <laughs> and there are nice things to come. Are we talking about a um, an ass whooping? Or uh, an ass whooping from Google, as in them dealing out a little bit more justice. Or they always uh, to be more justice. Uh, that that's what they tell us. <laughs> okay. No evil. <laughs> I just want them to sort out their freaking review structure. <laughs> Still on that. Yeah, I, 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 I actually did mention it over there, and uh, they, they were quite astonished that it happened that way. Uh. Oh, were they? Well, can I change it back now? So they didn't now, heed your, uh, <laughs> your feedback yet. They haven't read the feedback. Bloody hell, the amount of people that have left feedback on that, saying this is wrong. And how long does it take for... Jesus... Two months now, it's still booked. I, I see somebody um, made a milk carton and, and, and put, put a, uh, um, um, a, 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 a message, you know, Google is missing or, 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 or something, some that, that, that affect uh, begging, begging them. Uh, They're saying after six months they hadn't had a resolution to the shifting of their business. Oh, by the way, Tim, um, the, the one that you helped me with, and, and Masataki and Edwin, uh, thank you guys. Uh, um, the one that you helped me with, the, the client that had been moved for something like four or five months and couldn't move their, their pin on the map, uh, finally happened. Oh, result. Mm. Yeah, takes a bit of time. And um, I don't know how the system works, but I, I ended up getting five emails from Google saying, well, thank, thank you very much. Your change was... <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know what? I sent feedback on that one that's completely broken, and they've sent me emails going, well, thank you very much. And what, what do they say? Oh, as a local person, you, you, you understand the businesses in the area better than anyone else, and thank you for contributing. I'm thinking... You still haven't fixed it. <laughs> oh well. Okay, our next item of business is um, something that might ra 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 raise a few passions: um, the gamification of the link graph by Google. Uh, um, Simon Penson argues that Penguin needs data and that, that the hard-working people of the internet provided that data. Um, the work with Disavow allowed the search team to leverage tens of thousands of other experts to send through millions of examples of poor quality links. That human-sorted data set will undoubtedly now form the basis of the next update, a much more intelligent versioning based on true big data understanding of what defines uh, good links from a bad one. If we know that they've used some pretty smart, smart gamification techniques to gather key data and, and help process uh, the uh, link graph already, what can we expect from an update that has been a whole year in the making? Um, before we go on with that article, I just want to point out too, <laughs> Google's always had um, 
this patent um, of um, um, monitoring people by the changes that they make on their website. So uh, our good friend Gary Ellis uh, um, mentions that Penguin's due out in a week and everybody panics and changes, uh, dro drops uh, links left, right and centre and so on. Um, that that would be recorded and um, utilised. That, that they'd get signals from that. Um, yeah, so that I mean, that's interesting. But it, 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 people were saying, oh, "Oh, people that use the disavow tool won't affect anything. Google won't use it." Well, Simon Penson seems to think so. What do you guys think? Well, I think I think they're still testing. Yeah, I mean the thing is, look, it would be natural for them to if if you've created Penguin and over the last two years you've had I don't know millions of people submitting, um, you know, disavowed sites, domains, URLs. Um, you know, it would. It, that, that's pure gold for them. That, that is, you know, it's sitting there. Um, these are what people perceive to be crap um, domains, um, pages, it, and it's 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 data for them to look at. They'd be silly not to. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure, they're looking at it. You know, they're building patterns, and yeah, definitely. At SMX a couple of years ago, um, um, we asked Brian White about this when the, not long after the disavow um, tool happened, and um, we asked him directly whether or not they were using the data um, from the disavow, disavow files, and um, he said, "No, we're not doing that at the, at the moment. Um, however, in due course." Um, that may change. <laughs> um, you know, so now that they've probably got several million um, people submitting disavow files, um, maybe they've got a, a, a strong enough corpus of uh, data to lean on to start doing some pretty hefty analysis to better strengthen Penguin as an algorithm to, you know, do a better job of identifying low quality links essentially, so that the algorithm can do it automatically, better than it is today. Yeah, but uh, that's the problem. Do they have enough data? Um, are people outside the SEO community uh, submitting uh, this of all uh, files? <laughs> Probably not, but the point is, they need anything to make it better than it is or was, because Jesus Christ, the spam queries are just, you know, there's people slapping penguin left, right, and centre. I think I think you make a good point, Edwin. Um, you know, people outside the SEO community. Um, and today, I, I spoke uh, with a new client, a, a real estate agent, and uh, I said, um, um, "What is your um, um, Google Plus um, pro profile? I can't see it there." He said, "What is Google Plus?" Yeah, you know, th this is a, a real estate company, uh, and asking me what is Google Plus. So therefore, and of course, he doesn't have a brand page doesn't have a, um, a, a Google local listing. You'd think that these would be basics, but um, I, I think we live in a, a bit of a bubble, you know, and uh, what we've, our, our reality um, isn't the same reality as the rest of the world. Yeah, and even, even if the Webmaster um, has uh, Webmaster tools uh, verified, I don't think there's a way uh, to get there from the, the dashboard, is there? So, 
they don't know where it is. And if they know where it is, they get a huge banner like, uh, be careful, this is an advanced tool, and you shouldn't proceed if you don't know what you're doing. So I don't know if, if, if people are using it that, that much. Uh, and if the data uh, is really big data, um, like suggested in this article. Okay, well, it, it looks like we've um, exhausted this subject. I, I, I was expecting to see hand waving. <laughs> And when you um, posted uh, well, an, annou an announcement and made a, 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 um, a, a very uh, uh, insightful comment, um, um, it's on Google revamping uh, the change of address tool within Webmaster Tools, um, but has no no support for uh, switching HTTP to HTTPS. Yes, in, in the past, uh, Google said that uh, moving from HTTP to HTTPS is somewhat like a side move, um, but there's still no support for it, uh, for it uh, within uh, Google Webmaster Tools. And what I do like about that new uh, uh, tool is that they have the 301s. Uh, I haven't got time to test it, or but they show uh, if your site uh, uh, did the trio once and if they uh, work properly. So, so that's 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 a nice uh, tool to have, no? Alice the Lattimore is leaving us. Um, he's um, got work in 5.5 hours. Um, mate, thanks for keeping the ship afloat tonight. Uh, um, I had uh, problem after problem. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's, it probably didn't. Someone else would have. That's fine. It's all good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good to fly, guys. I'll see you next week. Good night, Alice. Anybody else? Um, um, oh, uh, Edwin, you said you thought someone else was the problem solver? Who, who was that? Uh, someone from the East. From the East. Uh, too far, too far thought. Uh, I'm confused. Yeah, well, skip it then. Okay, we'll skip it. All right, um, so our next news article um, is the Knowledge Graph Beyond Freebase. Uh, Bill Slorsky, uh, I won't read the whole the whole thing. You, you, you can read it yourself on the SEO News community on uh, Google+. Um, but um, I'll just read the first line. Uh, what happens? Uh, oh... No, really, there's not much there for me to um, give a, a, a brief summary. Um, what do you guys uh, have on this one? Well, there's an interesting read. Uh, uh, it is a pattern, so maybe Google isn't using it. Uh, basically what uh, Bill uh, Slosky uh, was investigating was the, uh, the, the question uh, raised on some conference. Uh, what happens when uh, the world changes in uh, some dramatic fashion, such as a country uh, ceasing to exist or a well-known uh, figure passing away? And um, 
on the, the conference, uh, someone from Yahoo was there, and they do it by hand. So that, that, that was really surprising to me. Um, and later on, uh, Bill found a patent from Google uh, that they may do it automatically. And how they do that is by uh, looking for the, the, the search snippets. Um, and then try to, to see if that uh, matches uh, what I have in their own, um, it's called knowledge fault. Or So it was interesting uh, to see how Google might uh, use um, their own index, basically, to figure out if, if something is correct or uh, something is out of date. Yep. Okay, I'd like to move on to the next one, um, number 25 on our run list. I, I think this was one of the most significant posts made in, in, in um, SEO um, in a year. I mean, so many SEO posts are just so much fluff. Um, but th this one um, was by Dan Petrovic titled The Great Link Paradox. And uh, if you're watching this clip, um, I really recommend you go to the SEO news community and find uh, uh, Edwin's post of the Great Link Paradox and uh, read that article. Um, in it, uh, Dan says something like, or says, says things like, um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to say it again. Uh, the last time he said something like this was uh, back in 2013. Um, he said, Google needs to abandon link-based penalties and gain enough confidence in its algorithms to simply ignore links that they think are manipulative. The whole fear-based campaign they are going for doesn't really go well with the cute brand that Google tries to man maintain. Um, totally agree with that. Uh, I mean, link-based penalties um, are so open to abuse. I mean, um, uh, Tim Kappa keeps an eye on uh, the uh, payday loans uh, people, and and uh, they are just having a laugh with Google. They just, you know, uh, the link-based penalties only work for the people that stick around. They, they, they only punish um, the, the, the working publishers of the internet. Um, and um, yeah, really, um, the search quality team at Google is, um, um, I think, the oldest team, and they're probably the oldest and smartest people uh, at Google, but, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, uh, they, they may be experts in search, but they're, they're not doing a great job these days. And I think that they should be searching for another job. And uh, then uh, drills down uh, a little bit deeper. Um, basically, what uh, Google used to say uh, was write uh, descriptive uh, anchor text. Um, that makes sense to the user, right? Um, and then Penguin came. Uh, which is too slow, and basically Penguin said, uh, if your uh, anchor text is uh, too uh, too much uh, of a uh, d descriptive anchor text, we might uh, penalize you. Um, so Google is basically going against their own advice. Uh, Yeah. The thing that surprised me, and I had a chat with uh, Micah Fisher Kirshner about this um, on Google Plus, but um, no Americans, uh, apart from Micah, commented uh, on Dan's post. Um, it's like people are uh, um, too frightened um, to uh, buck the trend, too frightened to uh, step out of line and. Uh, criticise Google for this 
colossal cock up that they've got themselves into, um, and um, that they probably you know think that um, you know that like the uh, the altar boys lying down quietly if they're very 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 quiet, um, maybe the priest won't get them. Um, well, uh, to be fair, Rob Wagner uh, did comments so. <laughs> Who, who was it? Rob Wagner. Ah, yes, yes, true. Yeah, Rob, Rob did. Yeah. But well, nobody else. Probably you say. Yep. But indeed, I'm I'm not seeing anyone else. Uh, no other big names. Um. Oh All well, right. sorry. Probably outside outside the U.S. Uh, there's more common sense. Uh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, look. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll go back to it. It's the Great Link Paradox. It's by Dijon uh, SEO. It's a brilliant article, um, and I recommend that you read it. Okay, another one. Um, Interesting. I, I, the one thing I took away from this, um, um, the, 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 the top five organic results uh, account for approximately 65% of the clicks. I thought that uh, a long time ago, or not so long ago, I should say, that um, um, that figure would have been higher. Uh, am I wrong, or is something changing? Are people um, searching? Longer in the um, I don't know. Anyway, um, it, it's a, a study on uh, click-through ratios. Um, you can s re read the article itself on on the SEO News community on Google Plus. Um, guys, do you have a comment uh, on this? I think you were you were right on the uh, sixty-five percent being. Um, being higher in the past, uh, without reading the piece, the uh, what occurs to me is is that maybe we're seeing the um, the figures for how Google is cluttering the uh, the SERPs up with other stuff. Um, the, the SEO community has been saying for ages that uh, that Google is trying to move clicks away from unpaid organic clicks to um, to paid ones, uh, to AdWords, uh, maybe they're succeeding. I don't know, that's uh, before I start waffling any further I think uh, I shall shut up. Well, well actually, it, uh, it was, according to the article it was lower. Um, For the, the two top sponsored links uh, in 2014, uh, the click through rate was 14.5, and in 2005, the click through rate was 14.1. So that's not a big difference. Um, it seems that mostly the uh, from the organic listing, uh, number uh, two. And three uh, are getting more clicks now. And people tend to get away from the, the first page more often uh, in 2005 than they used to. So maybe they weren't happy uh, with uh, uh, the, the search results back in 2005. And now it's a little bit better. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, all right, uh, let, let's move on to. Uh, Item number 27, 
Um, Edwin Young said, personally, I don't use voice search that much, namely because I find it hard to construct full sentences instead of filling in a couple of keywords. But apparently, uh, people do use it and teens get it. Uh, maybe adults are institutionalised to keywords. That makes sense to me. I, I have difficulty constructing a full sentence at the best of times, let alone in searching for something. Do you use uh, voice search a lot, Jim? No, I, I don't use it at all. I, I don't know how to invoke it. Because I, 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 I have a mobile that's around here somewhere, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm really... Uh, R really use it. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'd, I'd rather stay home. Uh, I can do so much remotely now um, that uh, I think it's just more efficient um, not to be mobile. When I do go out, I, I need need uh, Google Maps just to get to the shops. You know, it's such a rare occasion. So you use it for a direction, then? Uh... I, I I love um, um, turn by turn um, navigation. It, it is um, absolutely brilliant, um, it, and uh, yeah, I love it. Um, yep, or even turned on to come home. It is cool though. I mean, you, do you guys use um, maps for navigation or, or do you use Tom 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 or something like that? Well, I have my brain. <laughs> I think I have one of those as well. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm on the bicycle most of the time, so... Those turn by turn directions, uh, that's, that's not something I trust on a bicycle. Fair enough. No, I, I was uh, impressed uh, about a month ago when uh, my uh, a friend of mine used Google Maps as a, uh, um, basically as a sat-nav. Um, and it was it was very very impressive on the on the trip. Um, I haven't yet uh, thrown myself into the clutches of uh, the Google Maps. Um, my wife and I have a um, a Tom Tom type thing that gets transferred between the cars um, because we have older cars that don't have integrated uh, sat navs. Um, but um, yeah, very impressed with the way that um, Google Maps um, routes us around traffic jams and stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's way cool. And Bing um, is making great strides um, with theirs too. Um, have you guys seen the 3D in, in uh, Bing's maps? They haven't done many. Uh, cities yet, yeah, it's still out in beta, um, but um, the, the graphics are just amazing. Um, it's like they've taken a plane uh, um, at 300 feet and, um, and, and, and ta taken, the, taken the shots. That, um, if you were to open up um, uh, Bing, Bing Maps and uh, have a look at, um, say, the Gold Coast um, in Australia. It's a real treat. All right. Um, well, our, our last uh, article to it tonight um, is a good one. Um, it's um, a, a statement. Um, um, Carrie Hill was intrigued by the statement made by Pierre Farr at PubCon 2014 
um, PF, PF, PFR said, mark up everything. And um, um, well, I, I have to have to say that I'll, I'll follow that uh, advice because um, um, Pierre's my favourite Googler. Um, but then again, I might have misgivings to um, how much uh, uh, if I mark up everything. Um, Will I get any traffic to my site, or will they just take my answers but that have been scraped by Google because I've made it easy for them to do so? It's a it's a vexed question, isn't it, Rob Mars? Rob, Rob, Rob is nodding, uh, and, and for Rob, he's when he nods, he means N D A. So guys, uh, uh, Carrie Hill said, um, uh, and you can read this on the SEO News community on Google+, Plus. Uh, she lists five things that most local businesses should do. Um, I don't know if this fits, but uh, she said, uh, um, schema supports great SEO. It does not fix bad SEO. That makes sense to me. Um, Two, how do they contact you uh, when you are open? What do you specialise in, etc.? Three, um, use the most specific type of schema.org. Um, the last time I looked at schema.org, um, I, I reckon I'd go crazy. Uh, it, it, they're getting so many uh, di different um, um, ways to say uh, um, something and that. Um, I, I suppose I, my habit would be to, to, to figure out something which works and just stick to it. Um, mark up as much as you can. Mark up has a life out. Mark up has a life outside of Google. Um, and five, take advantage of new schemas, which is something that an old bloke like me probably won't do. Um, any comments on this? Yeah, the um, uh, schema.org does have a life outside Google, and I, I didn't know that uh, Pinkstrust was using it. So um, she gives the advice, uh, quote, we said markup in food blog helps Pinkstrust.com better uh, categorize and display your uh, reset pins for specific queries. It uh, also shows the ingredients directly in the pin itself. That's something uh, that I didn't know. Yep. Um, um, I'm just going to have, had a, I was just about to close, but um, Vlad Markov um, just asked uh, if he could join the panel. Um, so, with with um, your assent, guys. Um, I, I know Vlad uh, has a question. He asked asked me about it earlier in the week. Um, um, that's okay, is it? If I invite him in? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll um, respond, and hopefully he'll um, see that. Excited! Um, I've, I've spoken with Vlad um, um, a number of times on Google Plus, but uh, this will be the first time I've actually spoken to him in person. That's if he does turn up now. While we're waiting, uh, any comments on uh, the um, schema uh, news item? I think schema for local business is great. Uh, basically, uh, most of the local business want uh, traffic to their shop or their store. Uh, and that's fine. That's fine if Google uh, gets that data and serves that data directly in their uh, search engine results. The problem is uh, mainly when Google is showing uh, publisher data or copyrighted data. Um, 
and this this part uh, of schema.org, I don't see any issue with. Uh, Fair enough. Well, I'll have to change my, my thinking, uh, Edwin. I'll, I'll follow you. Oh, you left your own. <laughs> no, I, I like schema.org too for uh, local SEO. But SEO, what is it that we do? Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it doesn't, I, I think this is what uh, Edwin was saying, that what you make available via schema.org, um, putting things like um, addresses and uh, opening times and, and such, um, if Google wants to wants to take that and slap it up on its uh, search uh, result pages, that's that's cool. Um, some things I may not be so keen on marking up, but um, it does seem to have a um, a very good role in local SEO and it, it's like everything it's like uh, point one here schema supports great SEO but it does not fix bad SEO well nothing does fix bad SEO that's that's always the case there isn't a silver bullet but um, it is a way of uh, making location um, very clear to, to Google and to and to potential customers so yeah great use it Yep. By the way, uh, I see we still have viewers. Um, uh, I'm suggesting to you that um, in the uh, SEA questions community on, on Google Plus, um, you'll see uh, a link um, which will bring you directly into this Hangout. Uh, you can either choose to join now um, or um, you can um, wait until we go into green room, and you're more than welcome to join us. Well, let's go to green room then. I was, I was hoping that Vlad um, Markov would would join us. Um, it, <clears throat> um, it was only 20 minutes ago that he. Uh, he asked, could he, could he join? I've, I've given him the link um, in the Google Plus post. Oh, well, look, okay, yes, you, you're right. Well, look, uh, for those of you still watching, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, um, showing an interest in, in what we do. Uh, um, your participation makes uh, what we do worthwhile. And uh, we thank you for that. And we'll be back at the same time uh, next week uh, to do it all again.